the U.S. is about to elect a new president, and uh, so far it looks like, it seems like no matter whether we go left or right, they're both going to uh, spend a lot of money they don't have, so we still have to borrow. So, um, so the debt situation is it's not going to improve anytime soon. The gold rally is, is first and foremost expression of a very unsettled world, unfortunately. It's unsettled on, on several, uh, several fronts, and, um, and, and the reason why gold is likely to continue to move higher is, the, is that this unsettled uh, situation is not, uh, there's none of these are really showing any signs of, of uh, sorting themselves out anytime soon. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman, I'm the at JR Mining Guy on Twitter, and of course, your host for this conversation. And I'm really looking forward to welcoming another first-time guest on the program. It's Ola Hansen. He's uh, the head of commodity strategy over at Saxo Bank, and to somebody we've been trying to get on the channel for a long, long time, and I'm really glad it's finally happened. And uh, based on his title, you can assume or you can guess uh, what we're going to talk about today. It's mostly going to be commodities, of course, because I really want to know how are the Fed rate cuts impacting commodities? How is the China stimulus affecting base metals and other uh, commodities as well? So lots to talk about, and we'll get quite granular on the main commodities that we discuss here on this channel, mainly gold, silver, copper. And uh, if we have time at the end, uh, I, I, I ask, well, if you could also maybe elaborate on some of the ag commodities as well. And uh, of course, we're going to talk oil. Almost forgot about that, because uh, I'm Still quite puzzled why oil, why oil is only trading at around $75 a barrel, despite all the activity in, on the globe right now. So hit and like and subscribe. Really appreciate it. And uh, it helps us outgrow this channel. Thank you so much for that. Now, without much further ado, Ola, it is a great pleasure to have you on the channel. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Kai. Yeah, really looking forward to this, and uh, we've been working hard and long, t uh, or for a long time, to get you on. Because I've been following you on Twitter for quite a while, actually, and I have to I have to admit, I use some of your commentary uh, as uh, sort of my cheat sheet for some of my interviews here, because there's some fantastic information, of course, in it, and I, I recommend everybody to follow it. Because you you put out daily commentary pretty much on the commodities market, and from a bank perspective, that uh, is quite rare, in my opinion, that you also provide for free, not behind a paywall, and uh, you don't have to be like a registered investor or uh, um, accredited investor is the term I was looking for. So um, I appreciate that. Thanks for that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Ola, let, let, let's see uh, where your head is at. Let's start with our opening question here that we open most interviews with us. Uh, wh what's the state of the economy? And uh, we'll talk commodities after that. Well, that's, uh, that is obviously the very big question right now and, and, and really the one that has been uh, driving some of the movements in the markets, uh, especially commodities as well now for, for the last six months. Um, I would say that the, 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 it's probably not as bad as we were, we were, we were we worried about just, uh, just a couple of months ago. We've seen the, uh, the the bumper rate cut in the U.S. Uh, just recently, uh, just re reducing some of the worries about uh, recession in the U.S. But at the same time, we could also indicate uh, through some of the economic data we're getting that uh, it's, it's justified that they really kick off with a quite aggressive cut. Uh, we saw consumer confidence not being uh, being great, and th that that potentially could lead to some further slowdown. And consumer confidence is really what has been um, been a, a key issue in China. We, we've seen almost all the, the whole year that uh, some of the markets has been struggling as commodity markets, uh, those depending on demand in China, industrial metals being probably one of the most important ones, but also the energy market that they they all been been, uh, been suffering from this uh, lack of uh, confidence among consumers in, in China for, for various reasons. We obviously see the slowdown in the in the property market and and, and how they, they, they try to steer the economy towards uh, Getting out of the, getting out of the rock by uh, by exporting themselves into into profits. But um, again, with that, with the rate cut in in US last week, and now with all the stimulus that has been uh, provided by by China, at least for now, it uh, again uh, it has raised some some maybe some optimism that uh, we may have seen the worst in uh, in terms of demand. So uh, so commodities are actually having a great month, following a. a a big sell-off at the start of the month, especially in energy, where crude oil fell out of bed. Um, since then, we've recovered quite nicely. And we can see those sectors that are benefiting right now from these two developments. Precious metals, gold continue to rally higher. Silver is doing well, very well as well. And then the industrial metals and even the energy sector seems like it's, it's stabilizing here. 
Yeah, lots to unpack there, lots to follow up on, Ola. And um, you, you mentioned that it doesn't look as bad as a few months ago um, on, on the economy side. And uh, I just had a discussion yesterday with somebody on the channel. And one, one thing I've noticed, I, th I think we're seeing more, ter more language about soft landing, prolonged downturn. And I'm trying to make sense of it because I often go by gut feeling. I have to admit, I read a lot of headlines and then I try to come up with a, sort of a gut feeling of where we're headed. And it, it feels like the soft landing is not off the table. Hard landing, perhaps, but also a no landing scenario seems off the table. I'm curious, like, we don't need to define the terms, but how do you see this all playing out? Like, is there going to be no landing scenario based on what you said? I think probably uh, a soft landing is is the uh, is the direction we are we're heading. Uh, global growth uh, forecasts are still reasonably okay, and we have to remember it, the whole uh, global economy is not just uh, China and uh, and US. It's also places like India and other places where we we're still seeing very strong growth. So that's also helped uh, alleviating it some some of the concerns that we had. But uh, I think the the US um, the big question probably in the US right now is 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 whether we've seen the full impact of the very high interest rates that we had now for a couple of years and, and whether that's still filtering through to the consumer and to and to uh, to to the economic activity and and, uh, and and that basically means there could be a bit of a lag a lag effect meaning that it could still get worse in the US before it it eventually starts to uh, to get better so um, so I think with that in mind the uh, interest rates are likely to come down uh, at a relatively uh, brisk pace we also still got real yields in the U.S., and that's really not something that uh, that goes very well with the, the massive amount of debt they have. So, um, so I think interest rates will be will will be will come down to uh, to levels where we start to see uh, real interest rates uh, moving towards perhaps not negative, but at least come down quite a bit. So, do, do, when when you do your calculations and forecasts internally, do do you have a Fed funds rate target in mind when when you talk about that? Like you say, they will come down quite briskly. Is there a target in mind? I heard three percent might be the new normal. Is that a, a number you would uh, subscribe to? I think three percent, perhaps with an overshoot to uh, to down towards two and a half. Um, that's uh, that's basically what we uh, we're looking at right now, and 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 it really is based on on how much the economy can afford um, in terms of the the, the the debt levels, and and we are just uh, we're both just about to uh, elect a new, uh, or the U.S. is about to elect a new president, and uh, so far it looks like, it seems like no matter whether we go left or right. They're both going to uh, spend a lot of money they don't have, so which they have to borrow. So, um, so the debt situation is, it's not going to improve anytime soon, and that, that's really also one of the key reasons why we we continue to see demand for for gold, not only due to the de debt level in the US, but but around the world. No. Um, Ola, just to follow up on uh, what I mentioned earlier, you said it's not as bad as a few months ago, and. Back in the day, back in the uh, end of 2023, it was really easy to predict where the, the economy was heading based on the copper price. And uh, it was great because my, my, my gut feeling was per a perfect match to how the copper price was behaving. When we were talking about uh, maybe recession fees, fears were subsiding, copper started to rally. We've seen a new all-time high, which was also technically driven. But uh, it sort of really fit the sentiment, uh, that the copper price. Is that something you look at, the copper price, or is that... Uh, a proper mirror image of, of the economy right now. Is that Dr. Copper still relevant? I think it is to a certain extent. Um, it was obviously uh, Dr. Copper in the past, but uh, given the, the, the importance of China now as a main main uh, consumer of copper, it has become more of a, a China story. But uh, it, it's true, we, uh, we had this uh, big run up in copper and, and, and that basically tells us two things or several things, but it, it tells us one thing about speculative interest in these markets, uh, I worked for a hedge fund for ten years. Where when I lived in my days in London, and uh, we 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 operated very heavily in commodities. And I know how they behave and and how they like to chase momentum. And uh, once that momentum really uh, the ball started to roll, uh, just like we're seeing in gold now, right now, the uh, the speculative interest really uh, picked up quite aggressively. To the extent that, uh, and then it was actually further strengthened by all the the AI hype. Uh, a lot of investors uh, felt they they missed out on the the move in AI stocks. And suddenly they, they thought, well, hang on, the AI is going to need a lot of uh, data sensors and that's going to need a lot of electricity, that's going to need a lot of copper. So suddenly copper became an AI story as well. But then that then we came to the point which really highlights the uh, the, 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 the fundamentals of, com of commodities. You cannot, like an equity, my, buy a stock uh, in, in expectations of, of future growth earnings, basically made, buying today in anticipation that you're going to make your, uh, that they're going to have strong growth in, in the years to come. 
commodities are a spot product. They are balanced on a daily basis, supply and demand driven. And when you have prices uh, being driven to levels which are not fundamentally justified, then suddenly supply starts to, uh, to, to uh, emerge. Uh, from inventories or you start to see uh, demand uh, slowing down and that's exactly what happened when the couple wonder went that uh, quite dramatic correction over the summer inventory levels uh, at warehouses uh, around the world continue to rise at the same time as the price was rising that clearly did not uh, match each other and uh, one had to give and eventually the price had to give and now we came down to uh, to levels where which was incentivizing demand and now with the interest rates coming down in the u.s bringing down the cost of holding uh, non-coupon, non-interest paying positions in, in from uh, commodities uh, that has started to help. And now additional support from the stimulus package in China we've just seen. Now, really interesting, because I want to take a look at the copper price of just the last 20, what is it now, 25 trading days, because we're up 10% since the beginning of the month. Yes, you mentioned the Fed rate cut, but that only happened on September 18th. China stimulus only happened earlier this week as we're recording. So what really drove copper prices? Was it just front running what everybody expected? Because not too many market participants expected, for example, a 50 basis point cut. Uh, so I'm curious, uh, what, what, what is driving the, the rebound in, in price here? A couple of things. We have seen uh, the Chinese renminbi uh, strengthen uh, against the dollar. That's that's normally goes against what you normally see in commodities. That that when a strong a stronger dollar leads to lower prices, but in in China it's it's, it's different because there's such a massive import of, of commodities. So when the Chinese renminbi strengthen, that uh, that tends to support the uh, prices uh, in in uh, in, in uh, from a buying perspective in in China. But then also we we um, we we actually what brought uh, prices down actually also started to add some support because around the beginning of the month, we started to see inventory levels start to come down, not only in China, but also on the LME and also to a certain extent at the CME exchange in New York. So um, so the combination of, of uh, lower inventory levels basically indi indicating that uh, that demand was starting to come back uh, was the uh, was was what uh, scraped it off the bottom. And then once the bowl started to roll, then as per usual, momentum kicked in and buyers started to emerge just simply because they wanted to be involved in the in the in, in the, the rally that was uh, starting to emerge. Yeah. Um, Ola, while I have you, I want, I want to zoom out for a second on, on copper or global demand in general, because you mentioned global growth is stable. And we briefly discussed that before hitting the record button. OECD came out with their global growth forecast, 3.2%. Actually, they up, uh, updated it and uh, from 3.1% to 3.2%. And uh, I look at the US, GDP growth is 3%. The Eurozone is way below that. Germany is probably around zero, quite honestly. Um, UK is doing okay. But where is that growth coming from, zooming out? Because we always talk US, China, and then, you know, not, nothing else really. Where's copper going? It's coming from uh, emerging markets. It's coming from the electrification, uh, which even though we, there are signs that it may be slowing a bit, uh, there's still a massive need for, for rolling out uh, the capacity to produce uh, or to deliver electricity to all the all the charges that we're seeing uh, popping up everywhere. Um, the EV uh, movement is, is also uh, ongoing. So the so the, the transformation will continue to, uh, to, to, to take up some of the slack that we, we're seeing from lower demand from the property sector, especially in China, uh, but then we have also this, this, this simply the fact that we are we are we've seen a weaker dollar recently. We also seeing in funding costs in dollars start to come down. That that overall should be uh, be be helpful for emerging uh, emerging market economies, and uh, and I think that 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 will also add to the uh, to the underlying demand. And then I think we also have to remember it, it's not all it's not only about demand. You can actually have prices going up even though demand uh, show weakness simply because supply is obviously equally important. And that's where and when it comes to mining and that's obviously your your uh, your ballpark and uh, where you have all your expertise much more than I have I'm sure. Um, that is the 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 the, uh, the cost of of new discovery and the time it takes and the investment that is required. Um, just recently, I read that the average time from um, from from discovery to first metal is uh, in, in copper, something like copper, is, is up to 12 years now, up from around eight, uh, maybe a decade ago. So it's just becoming much more expensive to uh, to mine these metals. And and uh, and if the if the outlook for in improved or increased demand in the years to come is going to uh, come to fruition, then uh, we may have a we may have a problem. And we can see some of the mining companies they're cannibalizing each other simply because it, it makes more sense to buy each other than than go out and throw a lot of money into investment that where you where you don't really start to make any money for the next decade. 
Uh, I mean, for, for us trying to uh, pre uh, trying to predict the price next month, it can sometimes be tricky. These guys have to uh, have a sound idea about where price will be in 10 years time. And uh, that really is a, is a challenge. And so I think the supply side equally important to the demand side and one that, that uh, we see as another reason why commodity prices are likely to remain firm in the, in the coming years and, and, and thereby also um, basically meaning that uh, having a small slice of your, of your portfolio in commodities makes sense. No, 100%. And uh, BHP just bought uh, Philo Mining for $4.5 billion together with uh, Lund the Lundin Group. It's just a sign. Like It's an undeveloped asset. It's going to be probably 10 to 15 years before that is a mine and produces first copper. So as, as you said, like it's, it's not easy to predict, but I think we can all see where the puck is going, to uh, paraphrase here a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, Ole, we've, we've talked a lot about the Chinese stimulus package, but I don't think we've ever explained on this channel what is included in that package um, and how it impacts commodities. Can, can you give us a quick summary on, on, on that China stimulus package? Oh boy! Well, actually, it's, it's quite extensive. Uh, but I think the the, the uh, it's, it's it's instead of dealing digging into the individuals, I think it's mostly about lowering funding cost, making uh, making it more making funding funds more accessible, lowering the cost of uh, mortgages, um, and thereby hoping that uh, that the economy will 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 be stimulated. Uh, I think the it's it's a step in the right direction, but uh, but ultimately, will it move the needle when it comes to uh, the consumer? Will they feel more confident about the the, the future, and will they start to uh, spend some of their savings uh, in, uh, right at, at, on the back of this? That I think is really the, the the big question. So we've had a bit of a sugar rush in the market now for the past forty eight hours, um, and uh, and the question is really whether it can be sustained. As I said, I think it's. It's a step in the right direction. It obviously indicates that the, the Chinese government is, is is really adamant that they want to. They set out a growth target of five percent. Right now, they're quite a bit below, and they want to reach that target. So this is the first quite significant step in that direction. The question is is still remains whether it's it's enough, and uh, we'll see that in the coming months. But but I think a lot of the, the lot of this market is also about psychology and market psychology, and the psychology was was really weak when it was uh, because you you. Any commodity-related uh, headline to China is always China weakness, and uh, and and you when you're being presented with that on a daily basis, then then obviously you you do get a little bit somber in terms of uh, where, where you think prices are heading. So this potentially is a step in the in the right direction, but uh, as I said, whether it's enough, that remains to be seen. Yeah, one of the heads, headlines I picked up from from Reuters this morning was there's already calls for more government stimulus uh, to grow amid con consumer weakness. So they're really worried about the Chinese consumer as well. Um, they need to keep spending. It's, it's similar to the U.S. It's a bit of a service-based economy besides what they're exporting, of course. But uh, they, they need the consumer to spend. And uh, as you said, mortgage restriction and things like that will, will be helpful because the real estate business is, is vitally important to China. And uh, yeah, no, perfect. We, I think we could put a bow around copper. It was quite extensive, but I think it's the closest, uh, or is it co the, clo the commodity closest related to the economy in general. Um, now I'd love to talk with you about gold, obviously, and the precious metals. Uh, yeah. Gold has had a massive run up, and it doesn't feel like it's it's getting it's losing any steam here, and uh, there's still a lot of gas left in the tank. Um, r run us a bit through the the picture for, for gold. What has been driving it, and why has it gone up so fast, so quickly? Well, first of all, when we talk about gold, we have to uh, obviously uh, agree that this is a dead asset. It doesn't give you any interest rates. It doesn't give you a coupon. So basically, the only way you can make money is, is for the price to uh, to move higher. That is that is a tall order when you <clears throat> when you at the same time as least as we've had now for the past few years have had quite high interest rates. Basically, meaning that if you were standing at the beginning of the year, you had some dollars to invest, you could uh, you could look for for gold to move higher, or you could just buy a, a one year one-year treasury bill and, and uh, at one point received somewhere between five and six percent. That was uh, really left a lot of asset managers uh, out of the loop. They, they couldn't invest in gold simply because of that. That funding cost was too high, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, according to the investment uh, rules. But nevertheless, gold has been moving higher. So, 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 so I think that the gold rally is, is first and foremost expression of a very unsettled world, unfortunately. It's unsettled on on several uh, several fronts, and um, and and the reason why gold is likely to continue to move higher is, the, is that this unsettled uh, situation is not. Uh, there's none of these are really showing any signs of of uh, sorting themselves out anytime soon. We all know about central banks. They've been buying uh, heavily into the gold market uh, since 2022. 
Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, cent uh, governments around the world froze the, the central bank's assets. That sent a shiver around the market uh, and, and the need to increase the need to, uh, for, for central banks, uh, other central banks to de-dollarize their portfolios or their holdings. That has led to a very strong demand, which uh, I think is, is, is likely to continue. The debt burden uh, we, we talked about, uh, the World Gold Council in their latest quarterly outlook mentioned uh, high net worth individuals and family offices as key buyers in the OTC market of gold, uh, using the uh, debt worries as a reason for, for accumulating gold. Then we have the, uh, the beginning of the, uh, the rate cutting cycle, uh, which, we, uh, which we've been waiting for now for a while, but uh, we have seen in the past that once the rate cutting cycle begins, gold tends to do well, especially if it's, uh, it's happening during a period of recession, which we probably think we, can, we hopefully can avoid. But nevertheless, gold tends to do well when interest rates or the funding cost starts to come down. And then finally, uh, multiple geopolitical risks, uh, both the one that, uh, that cost lives uh, in Ukraine, in, uh, in, in the Middle East, but also the ones that are of a, of a more economic nature with potential terrorists, um, a tariff war uh, brewing, um, and but it could be extended once we, once we get past the uh, US presidential election. Uh, so I think basically all of these basically points to a world that is not in harmony. And as long as that remains the case, I see the upside for gold to continue. Uh, very, very good overview there, Ola. And uh, if you were to assign maybe percentages to, to the reasons why gold is moving on the geopolitical side, because I'm always worried about a geopolitical gold price, because l let's assume Israel and Iran make up and uh, there's peace in the Middle East tomorrow. Where, where do you see the gold price headed and uh, how much of that is currently in the gold price? I think the geopolitical risk in in the gold price is uh, is is very it's probably not that big uh, right now. Uh, we've seen that in the uh, in the oil market. Well, it it comes, but it goes almost as fast as it arrives. So, um, I think I'm I'm struggling a little bit to uh, to add a percentage to uh, to the gold price. But even if we if if we have a even if we have a a, a solution and 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 gold prices uh, drop four to five percent. We will still be within the uptrend that was established uh, last October. So, um, it perhaps worth pointing out that the, the low point we had last year in, in gold, uh, when this whole rally started, was the day before the uh, Israel was attacked by Hamas. So clearly, there is some kind of geopolitical um, note, notion uh, when it comes to uh, to why gold is going up. But I think. Uh, over time, some of the other worries have uh, basically taken over and become uh, and become the main driver. So perhaps a a correction, but I think not one that uh, or or a consolidation, but not one that leads to a reversal. Very very interesting statement because I'm always a bit worried. Like where will gold trend if if the the issues subside? Let's let's call it that. Let's simplify it. But uh, th that's a really interesting statement because there's the uptrend line, the 200-day moving average, and all that that's supporting it. And even a small correction of four or five percent will will keep it uh, in in that uptrend. That's quite optimistic and uh, really really curious. Now mo moving forward, like you know, other factors that are priced into the gold price, like how much is another maybe 50 basis point cut priced in already? And I'm um, always trying to figure out what, what, what is priced into the gold. Um, it seems obviously on paper quite expensive. And uh, let's, uh, let's say the Fed in 49 or 48 days makes another 50 basis point cut right after the US election. Is that priced in already, Ola? Uh, I don't think so at this moment. Uh, it looks like for, for, for the remainder of the year, we have another 50 basis points, uh, give or take, uh, priced into the market. But uh, should they deliver another 50, 50 uh, basis points in one, one go, then, uh, then that, that, that could perhaps, perhaps put the cat among the pigeons in terms of surprising <laughs> the market. So, uh, so that, that is uh, most certainly worth, uh, worth keeping to keep an eye on. But, uh, but just generally, the, the fact that we are seeing interest rates coming down and, and also the real deals, which, which for, for a long time was a, a key driver uh, for gold, simply because gold, uh, at, uh, at the end of the day, really is uh, what 70, 80 percent uh, driven by algorithmic uh, 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 technologies or strategies and, and very limited uh, impact by, by human touch, uh, actual physical people sitting and pressing and buy and sell button. It is mostly technical trading. And obviously these these uh, robots or algos, they are looking for correlations. And for a long time, correlation was very high relative to uh, real yields, uh, real yields going up, gold going down, vice versa. That obviously broke down in the last few years simply because central banks took over, took over and, and, um, and, 
and uh, I'll say investors in in the in the east uh, took over from the west, and uh, they were not to the to the, a, a dollar and uh, especially interest rate sensitive as as investors in the west have, have been for quite a while. Oh, absolutely. Risk capital or capital into the gold space completely disappeared once the Fed started raising rates. I've noticed that, particularly on the mining side. So that, that was interesting. Um, I've just I just looked up a, the Fed Watch tool, by the way, and uh, it's 43 days until the next Fed meeting. 58% of another 50 basis point cut. And that's right after the US election, which is really interesting. And you've just said it's not priced in yet. Um, so I, well, I have to ask and you don't have to answer if you can't. But uh, what's your gold price target until the end of the year? Uh, that's a good one. Um, <laughs> having having been forced to revise it higher twice already, um, the, the last one was uh, twenty five hundred, which we are well through as well. But I think the uh, end of the year it's it's, uh, it, it's it's tricky because there's there's not really um, uh, unless we we do have a, a a nice little December run up as we've seen in the past. Because I, I think we at, we are due a, a a consolidation, and that consolidation could it could last maybe a month or two uh, sooner or later. Um, because simply the, the the biggest gold's biggest threat right now is simply because that its own success it's become so expensive that if you're an investor and you want to get involved in in, in gold and you're really balking at the uh, the prospect of having to pay a record price to to get involved so that uh, if if that is also the 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 sentiment uh, among central banks that they will just want to hold back a bit and see if they see whether whether this uh, this can be sustained in the short term, then uh, we may end up with a with a bit of a buying pause in, in gold. So far, there's not really any sign of it, signs of it, but we all know no, nothing ever goes in a straight line, and 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 we will see a correction uh, when probably when we when we least expect it. So, I think with that in mind, and and which potentially could take us a hundred, uh, maybe two hundred, in a worst case scenario, dollar lower, um, then I, I I struggle to see three thousand before a year end. But uh, that's most certainly. Uh, in the, I would say in the cards for for next year, and 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 if that uh, ends up being the case, then on the percentage basis, you will see silver do even better. Perfect segue, Ola. Appreciate it. Uh, I just pulled up the silver chart versus copper, and uh, I've been castized down in the comments below, and because uh, I've been saying silver is behaving like an industrial metal price wise, and uh, it, it trades more like copper. And this is the silver versus copper chart. Uh, just over the last, what is that since? Let's, let's make it year to date here real quick. I just pulled that up. So I'm not a chart technician, but if I look at that behavior, yes, silver, but the, the moves are almost identical if you look at it. Right? I'm, not an, like, I'm not a chart technician or anything, but I'm just driving, trying to make a point here. Silver is trading like a base metal, maybe a bit more higher leverage, but the peaks and the lows are almost identical here. And I'll, I'll take that off the screen again, but... Uh, I'm really curious what your thoughts are and uh, how, how are you rating silver internally right now and uh, how do you price forecast? Well, I think it's, it, well, it, it, there, it, it, it makes sense uh, that, that the, uh, the impact from uh, input from industrial metals is uh, as, as relatively high as it is because silver is 50%, 50-50 uh, split between precious and, uh, and industrial use. Um, and and that basically means it's it's taking its cue from from both uh, both both metals, um, and that's also the reason why why while we had this uh, quite uh, quite a big correction in industrial metals uh, over the summer when inventory levels, as you mentioned, in China didn't uh, continue to rise, silver was uh, silver uh, fell off a cliff as well, and um, and it, it just highlights what uh, silver is. It's basically gold on steroids. Um, and that goes in both directions, and that's that's something that, uh, as an investor, one has to live with. Uh, that uh, that when golds go 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 up, silver do better. When it, when gold uh, correct or move lower, then silver has uh, can have some really bad days. Um, so what will it take? Well, it, it will take the same thing as we happened in, as happened back in 2011, um, when silver briefly touched fifty dollars. Back then, uh, the world was recovering from the great financial crisis, uh, not least helped by a massive amount of stimulus coming into the system from China, uh, supporting a lot of uh, purchasing of industrial metals. So uh, copper and uh, the other metals were having a, having a very strong rally to the upside that, uh, back then. That supported silver. At the same time, gold was also moving up because everyone was worried about quantitative easing and what it would do to inflation. And the dollar was weakening at the same time. So the, the ingredients for silver rally is, uh, is is threefold that we see a weaker dollar that industrial metals uh, remain firm and we see uh, firm price action in the, in the gold price 
and these these three things I would say really has come to fruition now in the past few weeks, and that's that's why at this point in time now I'm just looking down. We got silver up eleven uh, percent, and we have gold up uh, uh, around six percent, and um, and that's a reflection of that. And and this is also coming back to uh, the point about uh, having to buy something at a record high. The problem with silver is obviously it's not being bought by central banks, so you don't have that that underlying bid in the market from central banks. But at the same time. Buying silver at uh, 30 plus uh, when it hit 50 uh, back in 2011, relative to having to pay pay a record high price for gold, that is probably also uh, incentivizing some investors to uh, to take a look at silver instead of gold. And then looking at the chart, we still need to take out that 32, 32.50 area. If we do that, then we have, I would say, quite a lot of fresh and clear air uh, above us where where the market could uh, could have a have a good time. So uh, so with that in mind. Uh, silver is most certainly certainly worth watching if you uh, if you believe in, if you are believing in higher metal prices. No, it, it's it's very rare that I have the YouTube title figure it out before an interview. But uh, in, for for our conversation, this was the case because I'm stealing it from what you posted on on Twitter. Um, I think this morning it's at the cheap alternative. Right, so um, that's what what I'm going to use um, as, as the Twitter or the YouTube thumbnail title as well. So um, it, it makes a lot of sense, and you just explained perfectly why and where things are headed. And uh, same same question. I know, like uh, almost a bit cheesy to ask, but uh, what's your price target for silver? I uh, I. I <laughs> you got me there because I, I can't remember the number. I, I, I just because I'm, I'm publishing my uh, my outlook in, uh, in 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 for the uh, for the fourth quarter in in the uh, in a week's time or so, and uh, and it's uh, and and uh, you just got me there because I was I was more <laughs> focusing on the on the ratio. Um, so basically, saying that uh, we we can do our calculations while we talk because uh, because we uh, as I as I as I highlight in that I'm looking for three thousand in gold and uh, and in in a, in a in a conservative uh, case. Looking for uh, for silver, the gold silver ratio to move back down towards that uh, uh, somewhere between eighty and seventy five, and let's say it goes to seventy five. Will that basically have a that That's basically 40. brings the uh, silver up to forty dollars? So yeah. um, so that is uh, so, so so that basically is, is the potential potential outlook that uh, that continued uh, support for gold could see the and and the uh, and, and and this is based on the stimulus. Packages in in China also that that they do have the positive impact that the market is is trying to price in right now. Then uh, in a in a in a very good positive scenario, we could see silver move towards forty. No, no, fantastic. Really appreciate that overview there, Ola. And uh, I want to use the last five minutes to talk about oil real quick because I think it's one of the main commodities. Of course, wars are being fought over it. Um, we we need to talk about it. Um, Gold oil is at about $75 a barrel. Uh, it was at $70 earlier this week, so it's moved up a little bit. Um, but but I mentioned it in my intro, I'm a bit puzzled why oil is not at three digits. Why isn't it a hundred dollars a barrel? And I think we, I'd love to see what you, what your reasoning for that is and where where oil is trending. Um, curious what your thoughts are on the oil price there, Ola. Two things: demand growth in China was 1.3 million barrels a day in 2023. So far this year, we are heading for around 200,000. So we've seen a massive drop in demand growth for, from China in the in the last 12 months. Uh, part of that is the economic weakness. Uh, other parts is also the uh, the very fast uh, transition towards uh, EVs and hybrids that they are experiencing in China right now. So, so demand for gasoline and diesel is is uh, is peaking out, uh, potentially peaking out already this year. So that's what that's on one side. Then the, do, if you have the production side, OPEC has. Um, I would say that they've done well, but at the same time, they, they, the, the reason why uh, they, we, we're down here is, is also part of their the re, is, is also partly their own fault, uh, simply because they they opted to cut production uh, on a, on a couple of occasions in the past few years, basically to stabilize prices at a higher level, uh, preferably I'll say probably close to ninety dollars and where we are right now. Um, that has that has that has failed for two reasons. Uh, simply because the the global economic uh, demand outlook has has uh, slowed uh, by more than they expected, and at the same time the the higher price for longer has also invited uh, non OPEC plus producers uh, to increase production. We're seeing that in in North America. We're seeing that in in South America. We're seeing that in Norway and and, and elsewhere. And that's adding to uh, to the barrels, and and that basically is adding pressure on OPEC as the uh, as the as the the one that tries to balance the price to uh, to continue to uh, to stay uh, vigilant on the production side, and that's also um, and that's another problem because they have their quotas and then they have their cheaters, 
And <laughs> um, the the big cheaters are well known. That's Kazakhstan. It's Iran. It's also Russia. Russia probably give it them. They need the, they need to produce as much as they uh, they, they can in order to to uh, to uh, make up for lost revenue in gas. Um, Iran and Kazakhstan has promised to do something. They are not delivering. And then probably the biggest cheater is UAE, and uh, that's obviously a very hot potato considering it's a key member of, of OPEC. And uh, and right now uh, the the uh, there are there are reports uh, basically highlighting that potentially they could be producing a half a million barrel a day more than the, their level, even though they're saying themselves that they're producing bang on what they uh, what they have been uh, been given as a quota. So. Overproduction from uh, OPEC and uh, weak demand is the reason why we're down here. And then you have you asked the geopolitical question, uh, mm-hmm. Kai, and, and it's so much different now than it was 20 years ago. 20 years ago, the main buyer of crude oil from the Middle East was the US. Today, they could almost live without it. And instead, the main buyers are big countries, nations in Asia. It's China, the, uh, the biggest one. By cutting off production uh, or transportation from the uh, the key production areas in the Middle East, you would not hurt the U.S. You would hurt China, and you hurt uh, other, I would say, um, OPEC friendly. Well, the U.S. is friendly as well, but they they would hurt nations uh, that that would not uh, be be impressed by by these actions. So, um, so I think that basically means that, that uh, there's no appetite for a wider conflict that that potentially impacts supply from the region, and uh, that's why the the geopolitical risk premium that uh, that really started to ebb and flow since the the Red Sea attacks in December last year. Has has uh, has has come, but they've probably gone as fast as they arrived uh, as soon as things stabilized, and that's really the the uh, what we're seeing right now that that the geopolitical risk premium crude oil is struggling to stick simply because there is not a there's n- no one really believes that it's going to uh, to to spread and have an impact simply because the 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 uh, the interest from various nations involved in the area is too big uh, to be ignored. No, no, I really appreciate that. It was a really good overview because I heard that uh, the U.S. angle before, that the U.S. is pretty much uh, energy independent uh, when it comes to that. So dictating price on the global market, ha- it, or they can help dictate the price on the global market. Because I saw a chart earlier, I think the, glo- um, the UAE's or Saudi Arabia's uh, global market share in oil production is down to 10% or something like that, or it's trending towards 10%, it's very close mm-hmm. to it. So while the U.S. is at 16%. So the U.S. is by far also the largest producer worldwide now. Yeah, is that correct? Are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, really interesting. Uh, def- de- as you said, the, the picture has definitely changed the last twenty years. So, um, Ola, I know we're out of time, and uh, I was going to ask you about your other favorite commodities, but we'll save that for part two because um, I really want to know what my chocolate uh, is going to do over the <laughs> Christmas holidays. But uh, we'll, we'll catch up on that next time. And uh, Ola, like, really appreciate your time. Where can we follow your work? Well, um, as you all know, I work for work at Saxo Bank. Uh, we uh, and uh, we, we uh, you, if you are a client, then obviously you have access to uh, all this, uh, all our research in the uh, in on the trader. But we also have a website, uh, uh, just go home Saxo, and you can find the analysis uh, page where we where we post out our stuff. We have a uh, we we have uh, we have economists and strategists focusing on the different uh, macro. Or the different asset classes, and then uh, on a personal level, um, my Twitter uh, account is uh, Oli underscore uh, S underscore Hansen, and uh, obviously I would love to uh, to see you join the join the group. Uh, I post I post as you said uh, daily updates on on various things. I I particularly put a lot of attention on the weekly cut reports uh, released by the CFTC. As I think it's 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 a great gauge for for investors who are who, who try to figure out what what these kind of positioning, what kind of impact they have on markets. COT report a lot of short covering, or there are a lot of short contracts out on on gold right now. I saw. Yeah, on the right. the swap side is uh, is short, which is basically the banks uh, hedging against uh, commitments uh, that they they have. Uh, but the and the, but the long from money's money is is also getting up to uh, quite elevated uh, levels. But uh, uh, again, these money uh, the, the hedge funds or the CTAs they really got involved in the gold rally very early on, back in February and March, basically meaning that they are their positions are so deep in the money. So depending on whether they've increased the exposure, thereby moved their, their stop losses uh, higher, then they're, they're really, they're, we need a, quite a significant sell-off in the gold market before they start to their entry level starts to get uh, get impacted. So that's also why we've seen such a low level of volatility in gold, because the, the need to adjust positioning has really been very low for in, in gold. 
much more uh, much more volatile in copper and silver because some of the late entrants to the market were also those that were forced to get out uh, fairly quickly when the market starts to create lower. Yeah, 5% move in silver yesterday. Talk about volatility. There's uh, quite a bit of price action happening. Ole, really appreciate of your time. Thank you so much. I tremendously enjoyed our conversation. We'll have to do this again. Maybe focus a bit more on the act commodities as well, because that's an area, and I mentioned that before, I know very little about, but I find them quite interesting. So we'll, ha we'll have to do that. Ole, stay on for a second. And uh, everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. Really appreciate you watching. Thank you so much for subscribing. It helps us out tremendously growing our audience, educate more investors, and to tell you what the world is doing what is happening in the world on the macro side what is influencing prices what is driving prices we had a fantastic conversation just now with ola hansen over uh, about copper gold silver and of course oil hope you found this useful if you did hit that like and subscribe button leave a comment down below it helps us out and uh, we really really appreciate it. thank you so much for tuning in we'll be back with lots lots more thank you